Every kid has dreams. Not all of them get to live them out. That's the takeaway you're supposed to get after watching the documentary NWF Kids Pro Wrestling The Untold Story. But the only takeaway that I came away with was... Where the hell are the parents? The NWF, or National Wrestling Federation, <laughs> what an original name, was an independent league run entirely by kids and teenagers during the mid-1980s. What started out as some rough housing on mattresses in a basement evolved into full-blown armory events and a syndicated show on public access. If you were a wrestling fan as a kid, then you no doubt had the occasional tussle with your buddies in your parents' basement. But these guys took it one step further, creating a movement and proving that anything is possible if you work hard enough. But let's not get carried away here. This was by no means a perfect fairy tale story. Like any fed, big or small, this one had its faults. And some of the stuff they were able to get away with as kids would leave any outsider amused and or horrified. All I could say after watching this documentary was, oh, to be alive in small town America in the 1980s. Let's dive in. Our story begins in the town of Anoka, Minnesota. 13-year-old Sean Crossan and his friends grew up loving pro wrestling and decided to sign up at the local cable access station to produce a wrestling show. Because we all know that some of the finest in broadcasting history has come out of public access. Jim Smag's Sex Show! Don't ask. Their group, which was originally named the Tri-Cities Wrestling Association, had its humble beginnings in Crossan's basement in 1984. Sean and his friends would stack up some mattresses and flail around at each other, then put the product on television. Just try to, I guess, uh, uh, do what professional wrestlers were doing, you know like hitting guys with things like boxes and books, truly the most insidious weapons in wrestling. No longer content rolling around on mattresses, Sean and his friend took a video production course at the cable access station, which gave them the ability to produce their shows from the studio. The four small bed mattresses were now replaced by a wooden stage. That actually looks like it's a downgrade from the mattresses. At least they had some give to them. This is just a wooden platform. The kids were having fun producing their weekly series, but some working at the public access station didn't cotton to what those young whippersnappers were up to. There was one gentleman who always seemed to make trouble for the wrestling show. His name was Scott Tronson. According to the people involved, Tronson, who by the by is one of the few adults you will ever hear about in this documentary, did not approve of the kids and their wrestling shenanigans. Tronson would constantly get in the kids' way during tapings, like turning off the lights when their time was up. Which, and I'm in the control room and thinking, what is going, I'm seeing lights going off. I'm like, what, and my, my Mike was on the camera like, Mike, what's going on in there? Tronson just came in and started shutting the lights off. Old man Tronson never lets those kids have any fun. One thing he could not control was when the cable commission awarded the kids pro wrestling show a $500 grant for improvements. What? Sean was able to convert the stage into what would resemble a wrestling ring. $500 got you those four posts and some ropes? Look at them, they're not even proper wrestling ropes. They're like rope ropes. That stuff hurts. Between the ropes and the carpet on the stage, it's amazing these kids didn't get rug burns and staph infections. But seriously, they get a $500 grant to do all that? That's more than $1,000 in today's money. All of my Andy Booker friends are doing business the wrong way. All they have to do is sign up for public access, sign up for the grant, get the money, and they'll be rolling in it. Wait, does public access still exist? And when we got the ropes and everything, it even added more appeal. Then it looked like a wrestling show. It didn't look like kids just screwing around. Right, because a bunch of kids jumping around in their socks on a big wooden stage with ropes that can't hold anything sure gives off the impression that they are not screwing around. There aren't a lot of real conflicts mentioned in this documentary. One of the first real ones is when one of the kids no-shows an event. The other kids proceed to bury the shit out of him on their show. I am on my own now. He is out. That jackknife, jealous Jacob, and I have the right to say whatever I want, jack off. He's out! They dragged this kid's name through the mud worse than Facebook or the Dirty.com ever could. And since the show was broadcast all over the area, it means that a lot of their classmates saw it too. When I look back at it now, I'm thinking that was pretty childish on our part. And like many of the stories you hear in this documentary, it is quickly forgotten and never mentioned again. In 1985, Crossan takes his rinky-dink show and actually manages to get it syndicated, calling larger national markets to get their show broadcast well outside of Minnesota. Imagine the thought process of those cable access execs who took Sean's calls. Well, Mr. Crossan, you sound like a bright young man with a good idea. So yes, we will put your show on syndication. Yes, we'll put it in the slot right between the creepy naked old man and the two potheads talking about why marijuana should be legal. Crossan and the NWF made a lot of headway by going national, but every rose has its thorn. I didn't realize what kind of phone bill I was racking up when I did this. And when my parents got that bill, it was a disaster. I mean, it was one of my worst nightmares. 
If you're keeping track, that is literally the first time in this entire documentary that any parents are mentioned whatsoever. The first time it takes 20 minutes in this hour 20 documentary to hear anything about parents. I don't mean to sound like a killjoy here, but it's a legitimate question that I'm going to keep bringing up. Where were the parents in all this? Did they know what was going on? The scale of it? Were they worried? Was there no supervision? I know that we hadn't quite gotten to the era we live in now where some parents practically put their kids in bubbles to keep them safe, but someone should have been keeping an eye on them, right? In this league, all the matches were fixed, with the exception of title matches. In the NWF, championship bouts were all real. Just like how your grandmother remembers it. The former kid wrestlers tell the story of one particular title bout, in which the champion was able to grab the ropes no matter what the challenger tried to do. It didn't help the ring was a freaking rectangle. The champion managed to outlast the time limit, which infuriated the challenger. Three, two, one, time limit, land on. That's it, Andrew! You're not allowed to come over and play Super Mario with me anymore! Plus, I love this kid's celebration after the time limit expires. What the hell is that little dance he just did? I'd like to see someone else try and pull that off. Here is your winner, The Annihilator! Having tempers flare during title matches were the least of worries when Scott Tronson... Old Man Tronson! made the decision to get rid of the wooden stage from the production studio. So the old bastard takes away the platform and essentially leaves the kids up a creek. With commitments still in place to public access markets across the country, the NWF had to keep cranking out shows. Crossan thinks fast and relocates the Fed to his parents' garage. Because if you're already not going to pay attention to what your kids are doing with their bodies, what difference does it make if they're near or far from your not-so-watchful eye? Word was spreading about this upstart wrestling group, and the local media took notice. Move over, Vern Gagne. Step aside, Vince McMahon. Larry Burnett reports tonight that there is a wrestling group in Anoka which may give the big boys a run for their money. Someday. Mad Dog Vachon, The Crusher, even Vern Gagne. AWA footage! Real wrestling! God, what a sight for sore eyes! The answer may be right here in this garage in Anoka. You guys gonna start pounding right on us, too. Then at the end, one of us two is gonna come back and we're gonna get this... Kayfabe! 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 If Dr. D were here, he would know how to keep those nosy reporters out of their business. You think it's fake and talk like that? At the end of 1985, Crossan and the NWF were featured in the Sunday edition of their local paper. They were getting some great exposure, but it turns out it was too much of a good thing. Our insurance agent for our house read the article. And he reads the part in there about using the family garage to do wrestling shows with kids. That's all he has to read. The next thing I know, my, my mom's telling me we can't do the show in the garage anymore because it's in, our insurance agent will cancel the homeowner policy if we continue it. That's what it took for the parents to finally step in? So basically, at this point, it boiled down to this. Their opinion was this. I don't care what my kids do to their bodies. I don't care if they break their necks doing this little thing on TV. But the moment that it threatens the policy that ensures all of my material possessions, that's too much. I draw the line. That's too much for me. Also worth pointing out, there are only four or five talking heads in this entire documentary, and none of them are from the parents' perspective. It would have been nice to get that side of the story in some fashion. Why was this not included in the documentary? Were their parents dead? Were they bad interviews? Hell, like that stopped any of these guys from getting in front of a camera. Maybe they didn't know this documentary was being filmed either. Since it doesn't seem like they knew about the NWF to begin with, it stands to reason they were left in the dark with the documentary too. What do they know about their kids? So the NWF was left without a venue once again. But the kids didn't know the meaning of the word quit. They eventually found a new location, the boxing ring located at a local middle school. Try finding a boxing ring in any public school in this day and age. But school officials were resistant to the idea of kids coming in to wrestle in their ring, including the community school director, Mr. Daniels. I'll bet he's friends with that old man, Tronson. Needing permission to use this ring, Sean decided to take a new approach. He killed Mr. Daniels. No, the kids just went over Mr. Daniels' head and got permission from the school district. It's amazing how much leeway these kids have been given throughout the course of this story. Wrestling on a platform in the cable access studio, wrestling in the garage without consequence, a school district allowing them to wrestle in a ring on school property? I'm surprised there wasn't a childhood obesity epidemic in this town. Since it seems that like kids are able to do whatever they wanted around there, I figured they would have been able to eat all the pizza and ice cream they wanted. So the kids had a place to tape their shows, but ever ambitious, Crossan had the big idea to run shows out of the local armory. And like apparently everything else in this version of the story, they were met with very little resistance from higher-ups and began running shows there. How? I mean, how were you able to get a show like that running if you're a group of teenagers? Insurance policies, promotion budgets, rental costs, were none of these an issue with these kids? Does Minnesota have some of the most lax policies on sporting events in the country? So many unanswered questions in this documentary. 
The Armory Show was a huge gamble, but thanks to their tireless efforts of promoting, 350 people, made up partly of what I would hope were functioning adults, came to watch a bunch of teenagers roll around in their socks. It was almost like the first WrestleMania that Vince McMahon did. That was a gamble for him. This Anoka Armory event was a gamble for us. If only they were able to secure Liberace, who knows how much further these kids could have gone! Crossan was able to buy a real ring of their own using the money made from the first Armory show, making them look even more legitimate. The kids were promoting the next big Armory event, but then... Things were about to get ugly when Scott Tronson once again interfered with the show. Old oh, man Tronson! There's a rule in public access, you're not supposed to advertise products. So old man Tronson finally grew up here and suspended the show on strong grounds, putting the future of the NWF in jeopardy. I'm going to go to the cable commissioner in, in Anoka City Hall, who's in charge of public access, and explain to him what happened. So Sean takes up the issue with City Hall and he gets the show back! Good lord, this kid could have gotten away with murder in this town, and what do the adults here do all day except let the kids walk all over them? The NWF would continue to run armory shows while cranking out a TV product. The armory shows weren't all sellouts, but when they were, Crossan and his pals knew how to celebrate. And I'm gonna have a hold a pizza party for everybody down there at Dell's Pizza on First Avenue. And <laughs> Typical indie promoter, paying the boys in food. But things begin to look bleak on the horizon when older kids start joining the league. This kid joins, Mike says I got a new kid joining, he's 16 years old. His name's Steve. He drives a car. He's got a driver's license. His balls have dropped in everything! Seriously though, a 16-year-old in the league of 10 to 15-year-olds isn't that crazy, right? The kid soon learned that Steve was not 16, but in fact, 26 years old. Okay, never mind. That is crazy! How do these kids not realize how much older he is? Have they never seen a 26-year-old before? I'll admit, I could be pretty naive at their age, but I think I would have been able to tell the difference between a 16-year-old and a 26-year-old. How would I know that? Because I have eyes! Plus, what the hell is a 26-year-old doing messing with a bunch of little kids? Not only is that six shades of creepy, he could have used his time more wisely by going to an actual wrestling school with adults if he wanted to learn how to wrestle. So Steve, the creepy older guy, would bring in more of his friends, and that's when things got even more bizarre. A sudden change came over Steve Engstrom. Both he and Larry wanted their independence from the NWF. Then go out and do it! You're adults! You have your own money, you have your own time! What are you doing hanging out with a bunch of little kids, you freaking creeps?! The grown-ass men let the kids use their barn as a place to tape shows, on the condition that they'd be allowed to run shows of their own with the kids' ring. It seemed to work out okay, until the spring of 1986, when the two groups ran a joint show at the Armory. So, just to review here, these adults were riding the coattails of children! After the, ahem, super card, the adults did the unthinkable. They just took the ring and the money and everything is gone. The adults stole the money and the ring from a group of children. Damn, that's cold! Now granted, the NWF was silly and I thought it was amazing they drew an audience to begin with, but they were kids, and the adults stole from them! Who the hell does that?! The kids weren't able to get the money back, but after getting the police involved, they were able to get their ring from the doofus adults. The NWF ran one final armory event in the summer of 1987, and the NWF officially folded, ending on a high note. So there you have it, the story of NWF Kids Pro Wrestling, and I have to admit, their story is a pretty fascinating one. These kids had an idea, they had a dream, they knew what they had to do, and they made it work. I mean, we laugh at the idea of kids rolling around in a rinky-dink ring on cable access, but it clearly worked, considering they were able to draw paying crowds to their events on a consistent basis. And in the documentary, these guys said they learned a lot of valuable life lessons from their time working as kid wrestlers. But my biggest problem with this is the documentary itself. Sean Crossan himself directed and produced the whole thing, so you know you would get only one view of the story. But the fact that there were no parents interviewed whatsoever, you didn't even hear any of the guys say, well, my parents said this. You didn't get that perspective at all. I think it would have really helped flesh things out, because we don't even know where the kids got the money to run the armory shows. The interviews themselves weren't that compelling. There was no music in the background. They reused some of the B-roll over and over again. Overall, it just wasn't the greatest documentary in the world. Plus, I think these guys put themselves on slightly too high a pedestal, especially when comparing themselves to the average backyard wrestlers of today. I mean, when I look at these backyard wrestling shows, I, I think, boy, these kids, a lot of them don't know what they're doing. And those look like they're kind of more, you know, ragtag, just kind of thrown together, a bunch of kids, you know, just 
just wrestling and putting it on TV. But you see, that's where they were wrong. They were those same ragtag bunch of kids who abused their bodies and didn't know what the hell they were doing. All they were doing was just copying what they saw on television. That's not wrestling! The only difference between the NWF and most backyard leagues is that the NWF had a motivated leader, they caught a lot of lucky breaks, and they lived in a community where the adults were either very lenient or very oblivious to what was going on. No matter how you look at it, you've got to give it up to these kids for doing something that not only kept them out of trouble and having fun, but for bringing enjoyment to a nationwide TV audience on a weekly basis. So the next time you go onto YouTube and find yourself watching a video of some kids pretending to be The Rock or CM Punk in their parents' basement, just remember that some of those kids could grow up to be some of the next all-time greats. Or they could wind up looking like this guy. Yeah, probably that guy. Give me pizza! P.I.